the season of the latter rain is characterized by greater weakness greater weakness Acts chapter 4 and verse 33 the Bible says and with great power Acts did I get that right 433 and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace my God great grace was upon them all the season of the latter rain comes with grace to be a witness like never before to bear witness to the truth John chapter 1 6 and 7 the Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John verse 7 it says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that man through his witness the abundance the quality of his witness might believe witness with signs witness with wonders manifestations of miraculous you know occurrences of the spirit John chapter 20 30 and 31 the Bible says many other miracles signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which were not recorded in this book next verse but these are written they were documented that when you read them you might believe in truth that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and that in believing you will have life through his name let me tell you the truth one-on-one -on -one evangelism as we know it will not get the job done there needs to be an outpouring that will save nations in one day there needs to be a move of the spirit that can bring systems and structures under pressure in one day there are about 8 billion people and counting on earth and last I checked there are about 2.8 thereabout professing Christians both serious and unserious and you match that ratio one on one no the job will not be done the laws of our land today the realities of the time the growing hatred and wickedness for the body of Christ may not allow even the luxury of contact in certain nations there has to be another kind of formula that will bring the harvest hmm. are we learning the latter rain the seasons of our pourings are before us I'm still painting the picture of what an awakening and outpouring a season of revival a move of the spirit what does it look like the season of outpouring always comes with greater salvation massive salvation of souls massive salvation of souls beyond the effort of crusades beyond the effort of tracks a move of the spirit that you see men being saved sometimes without any physical human being talking to them visions in the similitude of that which happened to Paul and people individuals who in their salvation will be the salvation of a Decapolis one man got saved and ten cities were saved because of him one woman was saved and she ran left her water pot and said come see a man who told me everything I've done let me tell you the truth there are individuals that Satan is fighting their salvation some of them are locked up in your family the reason is because in their salvation will be the salvation of over 10 million other people hundred million other people the impact of their conversion testimony can be books that will save others the impact of their conversion testimony can be messages volumes of series that will bring many to Jesus and Satan will fight with everything he has when he fights a man from being saved he's not fighting one man he's fighting everybody to be saved through that man hmm. hallelujah so when you see your father refusing to be saved, your mother refusing to be saved, your siblings refusing to be saved, or people around your family refusing, it's not just the hardness of their heart, it's that there is a weakness locked up in the midst of that rebellion. And Satan is fighting because with the same zeal they served him, that is the same zeal they will serve God, ask Paul. Paul had so much zeal he went to the high priest to collect letters to persecute the people of God but when that man encountered God 
he flipped over with the same passion. Hmm. The same passion. The same passion. Outpourings culminates to genuine salvation. Can I tell you the truth? Every territory is at the mercy of the number of people saved within that territory. Every territory is at the mercy of the number of people saved within that territory. For as long as there are only few people saved within a territory, it means that there are many bodies Satan can use to fight the purposes of God. He says, a body has thou prepared for me. When we advocate the salvation of men and the salvation of territories, it is because Satan or any spirit for that matter depends on the availability of destinies and bodies for their purposes and their agenda to find expression. When it has to do with the business of salvation, numbers matter. Did you hear what I said? When it has to do with the business of salvation, numbers matter. Having five people saved genuinely and growing and having 1,000 people saved genuinely and growing, the spiritual impact will not be the same. Not be the same. Not be the same. Not be the same. For as long as as our territories are full of godless people, full of people who really do not know God, or full of people who are not even interested. Do you know? Satan will do all within his power to exalt those people to positions where they become a thorn in the flesh to God's program. Satan loves people who are available and are not saved. Do you know why? He places them in positions where it makes it difficult for the witness of the saints to penetrate that environment. Hallelujah. And this is one of the reasons why we must contend we are in the business of the souls of men. We are in the business of the souls of men. Let me repeat it again. We are in the business of the souls of men. Every single soul that Jesus died for matters as far as God's end time program is concerned. The average believer is not conscious of soul winning. We do it sometimes just to ease the guilt of religion and so that it doesn't look like we're not serious with God. But most people have not caught the body in the heart of God for souls. You don't have to be an evangelist. You just need to understand God's program. Hallelujah. And unfortunately, let me press a bit on this soul winning. Unfortunately, and I think it's something that I pray God will restore to the body. Because... The ratio of the passion that is in the average man of God, and I say this with all due respect, and the average church to see souls saved is below average. We need to trust God for grace. You can do, all, you can sing, you can dance, you can act drama, you can teach powerfully. If souls are not saved, then the kingdom is not advancing at the pace that should be. Because the journey of every believer first starts with an encounter with the God of the Bible. The journey of the believer does not start with a dexterous teaching ministry. The journey of the believer does not start with receiving miracles. The journey of the believer does not start with welfare. The journey of the believer does not start with good singing and excellence and administration. The journey of the believer does not start with career intelligence. No. In order of spiritual priority, there is only one spiritual process that converts an unbeliever to become a believer. And that is an encounter, not with a man of God, not with an angel, not with a rhema. An encounter with the son of the living God. The Bible says, he that hath the son hath life. And he that does not have the son does not have life. And I'm praying that God will grant us as men of God the grace to focus, to get back to our assignments and see that there is urgency and work in partnership with the Holy Spirit, taking advantage of this outpouring to see to it that the people who sit under our care truly become saved. 
Are we together? It is easy for Satan to distract us with all kinds of things, provided it will not lead to salvation. Let me tell you this. Satan hates salvation. Satan hates men being saved. Satan hates men finding the truth. He hates men coming to Jesus in genuine brokenness and repentance to receive his life. Satan will prefer a healing service than a service that leads people to Jesus. Because everybody Jesus healed still died. Everybody Jesus fed still died. Everybody Jesus taught still died. There is only one guarantee for life and meaning beyond this realm, an encounter with the Son of the living God. You believe that? Shout aloud, Amen. Amen. No matter how successful we are, real success in life, in ministry, and in destiny is measured by how many people came to Jesus through your life before other things. Other things are important, but not as important as salvation. I rather someone does not get healed, but get saved. You see that? When I go to pray for people, particularly if they have terminal diseases, my first port of call is not to pray for healing. My first port of call is to guarantee that they are saved. And if they are not, I preach Jesus to them immediately. Because if for any reason I pray for them and they are not healed, and I hear that they've passed on to glory, my greatest joy is that they finally cheated life. But if I pray for someone and they say, oh, the cancer went, this one went, and the person is not saved, I did not do much. Let me educate you believers. In order of spiritual priority, God's ultimate passion is number one, that all men be saved first, then that they come to the knowledge of the truth. You cannot bring people to the knowledge of the truth who are not saved. Beyond a dexterous teaching ministry, beyond an apostolic and a prophetic ministry characterized by great signs and wonders. The first objective of the outpouring is to bring a harvest to Jesus. Let me repeat for your learning. The first objective of the outpouring, the first objective behind the outpouring of the Spirit, the latter reign, is to see to it that many come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. There is the healing knowledge, there is the prospering knowledge, but in order of priority, the saving knowledge of Jesus. I rather not perform any miracle in my life as a man of God. I rather not have the grace for revelation and illumination to teach. If all I know is the gospel in its simplicity and I'm able to teach as childlike and as simple as possible, it will, it will translate to a harvest of millions of souls within the time God has given me. I would consider myself an extreme success. Versus performing great signs and wonders, prophesying to people, profitably so, ministering the word, dishing out revelation, series after series, and then at the end of it, there is a pile of unsaved people who are learned about spiritual things. It is dangerous when someone has not met Christ, but has met church. Because there's almost nothing you would tell them, they will recite your revelation for you, but they have not encountered Jesus. Are we together? Yeah. Church can be a culture that you learn, like English, like Yoruba, like Hausa. You can learn the culture of church, and yet you've not met the King of Kings. You can speak it. How are you welcome to church today? You can speak it. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 2, and yet you have not encountered Christ. You can learn church like a career. The same way you study mathematics, engineering, you can study church. The greatest and the highest objective of the outpouring is to see that people are translated from the kingdom of darkness, ladies and gentlemen, and those people include our family members, our unsaved ones, distant or otherwise, that they come into a saving functional knowledge of Jesus. I'm praying that someone seated here who has been crying for power, crying for miracles, I'm praying for you that in the name of Jesus, you will reprioritize your passion, that the passion to see the lost come to Jesus will become the driving force 
behind your need for power, the driving force behind your need for a large congregation, the driving force behind your need for more money, the driving force behind your need for greater influence, whatever it is that you seek, if it is not tied to the restoration of men to God, then you are asking amiss. Are we learning? Still painting the picture of what an outpouring looks like. Hmm. What comes with an outpouring? Increase and abundance. This is true. Every genuine outpouring of the Spirit does not just affect the spiritual lives and the spiritual health in order of priority, souls coming to Jesus, lives transformed, territories transformed, but it always culminates to increase and abundance. All through modern history and even from scripture, every time there was an outpouring, it started by repentance and brokenness and then the Lord heard them and the Lord healed the land. If my people, the Bible says, which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Listen, it says, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. But I will not just stop at forgiveness. I will heal their land. The healing of the land talks of prosperity. That God breathes his life again upon the territory. Many years ago, I watched a video about the revival and the restoration that happened in Fiji Island. It was so touching. It was such a blessing to me. It inspired me. I watched how that because of the rebellion of the people, I think they murdered some missionaries or something like that. And an indignation rose to heaven. And everything that produced within that territory, based on that documentary, it ceased. The fish stopped multiplying in the river. The earth stopped bringing its increase. And the people got sad. One time, a group of intercessors, prayer warriors, they began to pray for a restoration and revival within the Fiji island. And the Spirit of God ministered to them that there were certain things that needed to be put in place if they wanted to see the power of God come. And they looked for the grandchildren of those missionaries they killed, invited them over in the land, apologized to them nationally. And then they said when they finished by, was it the next day or the next week? I can't remember exactly. The river was flooded with fish. This is a documentary I watched. God heals the land. God can prosper men. Let me tell you the truth. And I'm not a prophet of doom. But in scripture, there are times that famine and economic toil, turmoil comes as a result of the sins of the people. Go and read your Bible. That when people sin against God territorially, corporately, when they become proud and full of themselves, among the many ways God draws them is to touch the economy of that territory. It's true. Because when people, when it affects their eating and their drinking, they can now listen to God. Something happens when people are full. To hell with God, they will say. So, any nation and any territory that begins to find out that economically speaking, things are going down. Among the many policies that must be enacted is genuine repentance to say something is wrong. If the earth is reacting, the atmosphere is reacting. These are forces that are alive. They react. They react. It was on account of the sins of the people that Elijah prayed and there was no rain. You see that until Christ, until God, Jehovah was enthroned again. Look at the land of Samaria. Go and read your Bible. Every time you see that it's not every economic problem, but many times when you find out that territories come under economic hardship, among many other reasons, is that an indignation has risen to God and there is a response from heaven. Do you believe that? Joel chapter 2. Give us verse 25. Watch what happens. Joel 2, 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, 
the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army. I had 26. Now, next verse. It says, and ye shall eat in what? And be satisfied. This also follows out.